Welcome back, everyone. It's my, my privilege to welcome Father Tom Rees, who is a senior analyst at the Religion News Service and a former editor-in-chief of America Magazine. As a former senior fellow at the Woodstock Theological Center, he wrote the trilogy on the organization and politics of the church. Archbishop inside the power structure of the American Catholic Church in 1989, A Flock of Shepherds, the National Conference of Catholic Bishops in 1992, and Inside the Vatican, the politics and organization of the Catholic Church in 1996. That last text is still a text that's given out to many members of various diplomatic entities when they come to Rome so they can understand things that are going on inside the Vatican and how it functions. I've been encouraging Tom with the reform to write an update. <laughs> During the summers, he works as a visiting scholar at the Marcula uh, Center for Applied Ethics at Santa Clara University. And in 2014, he was appointed by President Obama to the U.S. Commission on International and Religious Freedom and was elected chair of that commission in 2016. He once famously asked the question of the commission if, if there was religious freedom inside of the Vatican. I'll let him answer that. <laughs> He has a doctorate in political science from the University of California at Berkeley, uh, and he entered the Jesuits in 1962. He was ordained a priest in 1974 after receiving an MDiv from the Jesuit School of Theology at Berkeley. On a personal note, I'm always grateful for Tom's analysis, his wisdom, his sense of humor, uh, particularly the one that called up to the Speaker of the House and said, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? <laughs> um, um, <laughs> And I'm grateful for all those things, particularly when approaching the difficult <laughs> questions which are so often presented to our church. I'm delighted to welcome Father Reese back to the College of the Holy Cross. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> he was sharing with us uh, earlier today uh, that uh, after he got his list of speakers, he was very concerned because one speaker was ending up in the hospital the other speaker had been arrested. Uh, you can guess which one I was. Uh, I have been asked to uh, talk about the Pope Francis uh, as a diplomat. Uh, and especially what I'm going to be focusing on is his papal trips. Uh, these trips always have two functions, at least. One is a pastoral uh, function to visit the local church, to encourage it, to pray with it, to celebrate uh, with it. Uh, as a Christian community, as a pastor, he comes there. But he also comes frequently with a political message. Uh, he is an international leader. Uh, he's a diplomat in, in that sense. He has a diplomatic role that is played out during these visits. Uh, that he, he makes around the world. So that is going to be my focus, is on the second, the political diplomatic role of the Pope during these visits. Uh, I am going to uh, look at, uh, cover four points in my presentation. First, I'm going to look at uh, Bergoglio the man. Uh, most of this I stole from Austin, of course, uh, because of his wonderful uh, biography. Uh, on, uh, on uh, Bergoglio. And then secondly, Bergoglio, the Archbishop. And then I'll look at the Vatican, uh, what kind of institutional support it gives the Pope in his diplomatic mission, and what's the diplomatic agenda uh, of the Vatican. And then I'm going to take a look at uh, some of the trips. So that's, that's my, uh, gives you a road map of where I'm going in this presentation. First of all, Bergoglio the man. Uh, Bergoglio had absolutely no training as a diplomat before he became pope. Uh, if you look at the 20th century, the, the latter popes, Benedict, John Paul II, and John Paul I, none of them had any diplomatic experience before they became popes. On the other hand, a uh, number of the earlier ones, Paul VI, John XXIII, Pius XII, Pius XI, Benedict XV, all of them were diplomats working for the Vatican uh, before they were elected pope. So when they stepped into the papacy, they were ready to, be, to have this role as a world leader. Uh, pope Francis was not. He had no training, no experience in this before he became pope. Uh, his background in growing up in Argentina, of course, 
helped form him in his understanding of the world in which he lives. Uh, he, uh, his his uh, first uh, early experience uh, was under uh, Perón. He himself was a supporter of Perón. He got in trouble uh, in his high school for having a Perón button uh, when he was a student. Uh, he also lived through the military w rule, the dirty war where the military were kidnapping and killing people. And he, he continued living as archbishop uh, under the, uh, uh, democ uh, the democratic civilian government, but one that was very uh, corrupt, a very corrupt system. This is the kind of political milieu that he lived in and grew to understand uh, as, as uh, an Argentine. He was not a world traveler. You know, many uh, archbishops and uh, especially cardinals travel all over the world. This guy never traveled. As far as I know, he never came, he ne well, he never came to the United States. I don't think he ever visited Asia or Africa, even though as a Jesuit he wanted to be a missionary in Asia. Uh, he uh, went to Europe, he went to Germany, uh, where he was supposed to do his uh, PhD, didn't like academics, came home uh, very quickly. Uh, studied, he, earlier he had studied in Chile. So not a world traveler. This is not a man who had traveled all over the world. Uh, he did have experience with international meetings in Rome, uh, both Jesuit meetings. We have these what were called general congregations. Uh, he attended a couple of those. Uh, he also attended meetings of the uh, Synod of Bishops. And in those meetings, he met people from around the world and uh, learned, listened to their experiences, learned about their countries through these people that he met in Rome. He didn't learn about it by going and visiting these countries. He learned about it from the people who came from there. Uh, we also should, of course, remember he's the son of an immigrant immigrant uh, parents. Uh, and as we later see, one of his uh, leading agenda items, one of his priorities is concern about immigrants. Uh, this is somebody who's got that issue in his blood uh, because his parents uh, were immigrants. Okay, this is Bergoglio the man. What about Bergoglio the archbishop? Uh, as Austin said, uh, he would spend his Sundays uh, in the slums of Buenos Aires. He had a ministry there. And what he would do is he'd go in and sit in people's homes and listen to them, listen to their stories, listen to their faith. Uh, the result was he became a real spokesman for the poor as the Archbishop of Buenos Aires. Uh, he was a defender of the poor. Uh, he, he was very critical of capitalism, very critical of globalization and the impact it had on the people in Argentina. He saw the slums of Buenos Aires filled with people who, who had been farmers, who could no longer make a, a living because cheap agricultural goods were coming in from the United States. Cheap wheat and corn put these farmers out of business. They flowed into the slums of Buenos Aires. This, this was his experience of globalization uh, and what he learned about it. Uh, he was also very critical of corruption uh, as the Archbishop of Buenos Aires. The famous, uh, uh, the equivalent of their 4th of July, all the politicians gather in the cathedral, well, he read them the riot act. They didn't come back the next year. Uh, so, uh, this, so these are the kinds of things issues that he was already concerned about before he became uh, Pope. He also became a leader in the movement against human trafficking as Archbishop. Be why? Because he listened to women, he listened to mothers in their homes, in the slums, who would say that they were very worried about their daughters being kidnapped walking home from school. And who's going to care? about some poor kid, some poor girl, teenage girl, who just disappears. Oh, well, she ran off with her boyfriend. You know, nobody's, the police are not going to do anything. And this is what he heard from the mothers sitting, you know, in the slums of Buenos Aires. This is why he became in, 
in Argentina a leader in the movement uh, against human trafficking. A uh, small footnote to that that I love is that, of course, he was not a stupid man. He hired a brilliant woman, an uh, international lawyer, to work on this uh, issue for him. And I met her in Washington, D.C., and I, this was shortly after his election, and I, of course I wanted to find out what was it like working for Bergoglio. And she smiled and said it was wonderful. He did whatever I told him. <laughs> so this is, this is the kind of experience he brings. The other thing that is, uh, in, as archbishop, he was very friendly with the, the chief rabbi of uh, Buenos Aires. And he was also very friendly with the chief imam of Buenos Aires. This is, this is not normal in Latin America. He was also very friendly with uh, Protestant leaders. There was a famous, uh, uh, oh, what do you call them when they, you know, the kinds of things that uh, Pat Robertson used to do. You know, you, these big meetings and uh, prayer services and an arena and all that, and it was being run by these evangelicals, and they invited him to come and participate. So he came, and when it was his turn to go up and preach, they came to him and said, well, no, you know, normally what we do when, before someone gets up to preach is we, we pray over them. Would that be okay? Is that, can we do that with you? And he said, sure. He kneels down in the middle of the er arena, and suddenly he's surrounded by a dozen evangelical ministers who are imposing hands on the archbishop of Buenos Aires. Uh, the next day, the newspapers had Archbishop apostatizes. Uh, he was very friendly with these evangelicals, whereas most Latin American bishops hate the evangelicals because they're stealing their sheep. Uh, uh, Bergoglio's attitude was, uh, maybe we're doing something wrong and we can learn from them. In any case, he was friends with Protestants, friends with Jews, friends with Muslims. Very important, of course, was very important in getting him elected pope because if he wasn't ecumenical and interreligious, he would not have sold uh, in the northern hemisphere. Uh, there was a uh, cardinal from Central America who uh, was talked about as being uh, Papabile, as being a hot candidate. He was very, very much liked by the media. He's multilingual. Everybody loved him until he came out in defense of, uh, of uh, uh, cardinal law and said that this is obviously just a Jewish conspiracy in the media against uh, uh, the Catholic Church because of its support for the Palestinians. That was the end of his time as Papabile. You know, we cannot elect somebody who, is, who <laughs> has that attitude towards Jews as Pope, and yet that would be a problem with many of the cardinals and bishops in Latin America. It was not a problem with Bergoglio. Uh, so that helped his, his election. But anyway, we'll see later how important that comes in terms of his uh, work as a diplomat. Second, uh, he, you know, when he was elected, he just didn't, okay, now I gotta do, what am I gonna do? I'm the, I'm the head diplomat of the Vatican. No. He's got a whole institutional s a system in place to support him in his work. Uh, he has the Secretary of State, which is always very confusing to Americans because we think he's the foreign minister. No, he's more like a prime minister. The one who is the, the foreign minister really is the Secretary for Relations with States. And they have what's called the second section where they have a staff of about 40 people working on diplomatic issues. It's like our State Department. They have country desks, or actually they have to have regional desks because they don't have a big enough staff to have just country desks. So they have people who specialize in these countries and follow them and are ready, you know, if the Pope's going to take a visit, you know, make a visit somewhere, well, you've got these experts who can advise the Pope on what's going on there. It's a... You know, the, uh, the Vatican Curie comes under a lot of criticism. Everybody likes to gang up on it. I think actually the diplomatic side of the, of the Secretary of State is, of the Vatican uh, Curie is pretty good. It's well trained. They have a three-year program. 
at the Pontifical Diplomatic Academy where they're trained to be diplomats. It's like, you know, it's kind of like, well, you, you, some of you have been studying international relations here, or you know, it's like going to the School of Foreign Service in Washington, D.C. at Georgetown, or like, you know, the, it's actually, it's probably more like going to Annapolis or to, uh, uh, you know, the academies. It, you're trained for that job. So you're th spending three years learning languages, learning how to do reports. They're learning how to be professional uh, diplomats. The other thing about the diplomatic service is there are no political appointees. You don't make a donor uh, one of your ambassadors. Uh, as we do in the United States. So uh, they actually have a good reputation with U.S. diplomats. All of the U.S. diplomats I've talked to who have dealt with the Vatican diplomatic service have nothing but good things to say about them. Uh, these are all people who are supporting the Pope in his diplomatic mission. They also have a, uh, they, they develop kind of a diplomatic style. You know, uh, they're not confrontational. They're not in your face. They're diplomats uh, in, the, you know, in the essence of the word. And that kind of style is, is part of who they are. Uh, there are nuncios, uh, that's ambassadors as the Vatican calls them, and nunciatures, that's embassies, in 183 countries around the world. Um, in all the ones in blue, have diplomatic relations with the Holy See. Actually, this isn't quite up to date yet because Burma or Myanmar now also has diplomatic relations uh, with the United States, or with, with uh, the Vatican, I'm sorry, uh, with the Holy See. Um, there are other institutions in the Vatican also that help the Pope and gather information. Three important ones are the Congregation for Bishops, Congregation for Evangelization of Peoples, and Congregation for Oriental Churches. Those three congregations deal with bishops around the world. The Congregation for Oriental uh, Churches deals with all of those Eastern Catholic churches, the, the Ukrainian Catholic Church, the Byzantine Catholic Church, those, the Coptic Catholic Church, those churches that... Uh, follow a liturgical uh, style of like the Orthodox churches, but they are in union with Rome. Not most of those are in the Middle East or some in India. Uh, the Congregation of Evangelization of Peoples is the congregation that deals with what we used to call missionary territories, most, you know, Africa and Asia. Uh, and the Congregation for Bishops deals with all the rest, the, the more established areas of the church. Now, each of these are always getting reports. They're always getting information. People are visiting them. They fo they're following what's happening in the countries and in the churches in their territories. So again, this is all sources of information. This is one of the reasons countries like to have embassies to the Holy See. It has been called the great listening post of Europe because all of the information that flows into it. I was sitting in the congregation with the prefect of the Congregation for Evangelization of Peoples when he got a phone call about the president's plane being shot down in Rwanda. And that was the point at which the whole uh, genocide in Rwanda started. Uh, it's that kind of contact and information. They actually have better sources of information sometimes than the CIA and, and the U.S. government. One of the reasons is these nuncios that I mentioned pretty freely travel around the countries where they, they're, they're living. They visit parishes. They visit dioceses. U.S. government officials are afraid to leave their embassy compounds because they're not allowed to. Their lives are in danger. Uh, so... Whereas, you know, the nuncio can go off and do a confirmation in some village, you know, or visit the bishop and, you know, go around. That, you know, uh, and if something, you know, if something happens in a, they hear about something happen in a dispute between Muslims and Christians in a village, the nuncio can pick up the phone, call the bishop, and ask him, what's going on? He says, well, I'll find out. And he, the bishop picks up the phone, calls the pastor. 
and says, oh, well, they're fighting over a well. That's what this is really all about. And, the, you know, the information goes back. The CIA doesn't have that, you know. Maybe NSA can, you know, get a satellite photo of the village, but they're still trying to figure out what the hell's going on there. And the Vatican can find out in, you know, half an hour uh, what's, what's actually really going on. Uh, there are also other offices. The most important here is the Dictatory for Promoting an Integral Human Development. Basically, this is the office that deals with issues of justice and peace, with immigrants, with refugees, with health care, uh, with justice and peace, with environmental issues, care of, care of creation. Uh, these are the, and when the Pope needs a talk, when he needs to give a speech on some of these issues, that's where he goes and gets uh, uh, someone who can help him write a, uh, prepare a talk or a document on these topics. Uh, and, of course, these are topics that he's very concerned about. Uh, there's also the Council of Cardinals that brings him information. And finally, the, there's also every bishop in the world is supposed to visit Rome every five years and meets individually with the Pope. So there's all this information flowing from all over the world into Rome uh, to help the Pope understand what's really going on uh, before he takes a trip before he goes on any of these trips. He's, so he's not going to get blindsided. He's not going to go in and say, now who is this I'm meeting with? Or who is who's the, the president of this country? He's well prepped before he goes. What is the Vatican's diplomatic agenda? Well, number one is protecting the religious and political status of the Holy See. This is just an institutional self-interest. Uh, agenda item that they would be obviously concerned about. Second, they're concerned about promoting and defending the local churches uh, around the world. And thirdly, promoting Catholic social teaching, issues of justice and peace. I'm not going to go into great detail on any of those, but that's the basic agenda uh, of the Vatican uh, diplomatic missions, uh, dealing with those, those kinds of issues. Uh, as I said, uh, they also have that kind of diplomatic style. Uh, what kind of Catholic social teaching? What are the issues there? Primarily, in the Vatican is institutionally uh, is support of multilateralism, of working through uh, multinational institutions like the UN. The, the Vatican was in support of the League of Nations. It has been on the side of international organizations from the get-go. It was there at the founding of the League of Nations, at the founding of the United Nations. It has an observer status at the United Nations. Uh, it's highly respected by the United Nations, and the United Nations is very happy with their support for it. Secondly, of course, it's, it's, its agenda is peace. Uh, diplomacy is what... Is, is what they call for. They believe in talking to everybody. Uh, they don't believe in taking up arms and fighting. They say, no, talk, talk, talk. Diplomacy is the first option, not going to war. And they're very strong in talking in terms of this every time uh, they get involved in any issues. Uh, they're all, of course, very much in favor of nuclear disarmament. And they're also very much opposed to economic sanctions. They are opposed to economic sanctions because they believe that they punish the people, not the regime. Uh, Pope John Paul II, for example, was against the economic sanctions that were put on uh, Poland by the U.S. government uh, during the uh, military uh, uh, regime there when uh, they were having conflicts with solidarity, and the United States put economic sanctions on Poland, John Paul was against it. He felt it was going to punish the people. That's why, of course, the Vatican is against economic sanctions against Cuba, which is more even controversial today. Um, the, another uh, part of Catholic social teaching that they're very much supporting is, is peace through interreligious dialogue. Uh, I'm mentioning all these things because we're going to see that the Pope 
is going to be in continuity with the agenda that has been the agenda of the Vatican for decades uh, in terms of international relations. Economic justice, development, forgiveness of third world debt. These are, these are positions that the Vatican has had for decades before uh, Pope Francis came into the papacy. Uh, so, you know, when he comes in, he finds, okay, this is, this is where the, the Vatican has been. And, of course, now he's got to say, was this, are we going to continue this? Or are we going to change this? What, where are we? Uh, religious freedom, human rights, uh, is, of course, part of the agenda of the Vatican, especially religious freedom. Very, very concerned about religious freedom uh, uh, as a human right. Now, what are the issues that are most controversial in terms of Vatican international policy? Well, f first of all, the Vatican was against both Gulf Wars uh, under Bush I and Bush II. Uh, Cardinal Ratzinger was against them both. John Paul II was against them both. It also is in favor of a two-state solution uh, to the problems between Israel and Palestine. If anything, it, pro it probably is uh, more sympathetic towards the Palestinians uh, than it is to, to Israel. These would, both of these would be controversial issues in the United States. Uh, it has always had an outreach to Vietnam, to Cuba, to China, uh, to Iran and Saudi Arabia, all these countries uh, you know, part, that have been part of the axis of evil or countries that you know, the United States is, doesn't like and that some people think we should not talk to them. Vatican says we talk to everybody, always. And we saw this under... Uh, previous popes, and we see it continuing under Pope Francis. Uh, against abortion funding through foreign aid uh, or through international agencies. This is something that the Vatican has been very strong on also. Uh, it feels that the, these, uh, especially when aid is made, you know, health care aid is made dependent on the country adopting uh, 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 Abortion as uh, as part of their uh, legal system uh, feels that this this is something that they've been very much against, which is in, in also in context of its its position against what it would call cultural imperialism. This is the imposition of Western European American values on the rest of the world. Uh, this is what Pope Francis would refer to as as cultural colonialism or cultural imperialism, uh, very much against this kind of, of thing. Uh, now, what priorities does Pope Francis bring? I th these are things that you, you already know. His concern about the poor and the marginalized, refugees and, and migrants, indigenous groups, and his opposition to human trafficking. Remember, which he was very concerned about in Buenos Aires. You see how he's bringing those things into the, into the papacy and making these priorities. Uh, peace through interreligious dialogue and ecumenical dialogue. Uh, already a position of the Vatican, but one that he is going to continue to, to push. Uh, and finally, you know, a new priority in terms of, uh, Vatican diplomacy would be the environment, uh, dealing with global warming, his support for the, for the Paris agreements uh, on climate change. Uh, his also uh, great concern about clean water for everyone in the world. These are, these are some of the priorities that he, the political priorities that he is bringing in and pushing through uh, diplomatic uh, language and, and talk. Francis brings a special, his, one of the assets he brings to his role as a diplomat is his personality. He's got a very warm, charming, likable personality. How can you not like this guy? And that helps. 
If you're going to be an international leader, that really helps. And he, he has this. He has this humble simplicity in, you know, that comes across. People recognize this is a holy person. This is somebody who cares about poor people. This is somebody who uh, is not just out there for the glory. Like, a, he's not a typical world leader. He's not a typical politician. And people react positively uh, to that. And that's a real asset when he's out working as a world leader. He also uses simple language, not academic language. And this is a great uh, asset that he has in comparison with, say, uh, Benedict, who, who tended to speak in academic language, academic jargon. Apologies to the academics. Uh, but uh, Pope Francis is just clearer and simpler and understandable and tweetable and quotable, uh, you know, so that uh, he, he, he can communicate much better. He also has a great understanding of the role of symbolic gestures. And I'm going to use that uh, quite a bit in the rest of my talk when I get into the specific trips. The use of symbolic gestures as a way of communicating his message, you know, where a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, Benedict would not understand this. A book for an academic is the way you communicate to people. Uh, Francis recognized that that's not always the way you communicate. There are other ways to communicate with people. So, uh, let, I wanted to go through uh, some of his trips quickly in terms of what kinds of political messages was he doing. Uh, I'm going to skip the, actually the very first trip he took to Brazil because I, I think that was much more predominantly a pastoral visit and go directly to the one, the, the visit to Palestine, uh, Jordan, and Israel. Talk about a political minefield. I mean, when, he, when that trip was announced, I, when journalists asked me about the trip and what he hoped to accomplish, my comment was, if he gets out alive, he will have been successful. You know, this is a minefield. And he did. He, he, he not only got out alive, he triumphed. And he did it much through the kinds of symbolic gestures that he executed. The first was at the, uh, the Israeli wall uh, that, is, that the Israelis put up between them and the Palestinians. This is, this is near Bethlehem. Uh, he was over on the Palestinian side and his car is driving along and I, uh, he, he says, stop. And he gets out of the car and goes over and just puts his hand on the wall and prays. That picture goes around the world. You know, he doesn't say anything. He just prays. Now, Netanyahu went berserk over this. But he really couldn't lay a glove on him because he didn't say anything. He just prayed. You know, and uh, and so what did you know? Netanyahu was very, very, very upset about this. So when uh, he when he got with Pope Francis, he says, "Well, you prayed at the wall. Now you have, you. I want you to come and pray at the uh, the memorial to the victims of terrorism." And Netanyahu, of course, expected a fight, and Francis says, "Sure." So he goes and he prays there. So. Uh, he made a statement, communicated it in a way that, you know, was so diplomatically finessed, it was almost magical, you know. Uh, I mean, so this, this guy may not have had any diplomatic training, but he sure knows how to do it, is what I would say, first of all. The second great image that came out of this... Uh, uh, visit to Israel was when he went to the uh, wall of the Temple of Jerusalem. 
And, uh, of course, you know, people who go to the wall, uh, John Paul II had done that. I think Benedict had Benedict. I think Benedict must have gone there, too. In any case, you, you put a little piece of paper in with your prayer into one of the cracks of the wall. But that wasn't the picture that went around the world. The picture that went around the world was what happened after he prayed at the wall. Because he brought with him his rabbi friend from Argentina and his imam friend from Argentina. Suddenly you have the head of the Christian world, a rabbi and an imam embracing in front of the wall of the temple of Jerusalem. This, this is an image for the Middle East and for conflict that is just absolutely extraordinary. And again, you know, uh, this, you know, the, it, and because you've got to remember, he's, you know, you sometimes think, you know, in diplomatic miss missions or trips, you know, he's talking to world leaders. You know, it's the one-on-one -on -one talking with a world leader. No, no, he's talking to the streets. He's talking to the, to the people around the world. Suddenly, they see, you mean an imam, a rabbi, and a priest? Sounds like a joke. Uh, can get along with each other and be friends? You know, in the Middle East? Well, that's the message he's sending there. And then the final image, of course, is where he's with Perez uh, and Abbas, the president of Israel and the president of Palestine, and with uh, Patriarch Bartholomew. Uh, you know, the Pope as the guy who can bring everybody together. Uh, he Actually, he had the Pope and Perez were getting along much better than the Pope and Netanyahu. They were almost holding hands walking around where Netanyahu was walking behind them and you could see the steam coming out of his ears uh, practically. Uh, but anyway, this is, this, you know, the whole thing of interreligious dialogue as the way to peace. Now, his next trip was to South Korea. And he's, the, his famous quote there is, I came here thinking of peace and reconciliation on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, but the image that caught everybody's imagination was him in the Kia. Uh, when he, before he got there, he said, I want the smallest car that Koreans make. And they said, no, your Holy Father, you won't fit in the... We'll get you one size larger. <laughs> and so that, they gave him that car. Uh, there was a... I couldn't find the picture. There was a wonderful picture when he arrived at the airport where this little Kia... And you could see, I mean, the people are taller than, you know, the people standing around him. You can see how small that car is. Well, the, the cars were lined up you know, uh, as he was coming off the plane, and he had this little Kia, and the rest of them were all these huge Cadillac SUVs, <laughs> you know. And the Koreans immediately got it, you know. This is, this, is a, this is a humble, simple man who says that the, the uh, accoutrements of power is not what it's about. Leadership is for service. Uh, not for all the prestige that you can get. And this, this was a very countercultural message uh, in Korea and around the world uh, when this picture went around. There were other papal trips, Albania, France. What was interesting, the, the first trip to France, where did he go? He went to the European Parliament and the uh, Council of Europe uh, to show his support for international multilateralism. You know, at a time when the, Euro the European Union is falling apart, the Vatican is showing its support for uh, the European Union. Turkey. Remember, Pope, poor Pope Benedict had a hard time with Turkey. Uh, first of all, he made that uh, terrible speech at Regensburg. Not terrible, but Again, an academic speech, which was quite understandable by academics, but was terrible when quoted 
out of context, uh, s sounding very negative about uh, Muslims, caused riots in the streets, people were killed. Uh, and then it was also known that uh, Benedict had opposed Turkey's uh, involved, uh, uh, being in part of the European Union. So poor Pope Benedict had two strikes against him when he went to, to Turkey. Uh, he had to change his position on uh, Turkey being part of the European Union. Uh, but Pope Francis comes to, to uh, Turkey without all that baggage. And he goes to the Blue Mosque, one of the most famous mosques in the entire world. And he prays in the mosque, you know, standing right next to the, the imam who's the head of the uh, Blue Mosque there. Uh, this, of course, got him condemned for praying uh, in a mosque by right-wing Catholics, uh, got him condemned for apostatizing, everything else. But again, this picture goes around the world in Muslim countries, and you see a Christian leader who's respectful of Islam. This Christian leader is not leading the crusade against Islam. This is the Christian leader who talks in positive ways about Islam. Uh, again, peace through through interreligious dialogue and reconciliation. Other papal trips, uh, Sri Lanka, Philippines, where he talked about interreligious dialogue. In the Philippines, he also talked about environmental issues, Bosnia, uh, ecumenical dialogue. In Bolivia, Ecuador and Paraguay, very, very strong messages on indigenous uh, peoples, the need for economic development and justice, and protection of the environment. But it was the indigenous that really uh, captured uh, people's attention, his reaching out to indigenous people uh, and showing his support for them, their rights, speaking out in support of their rights, uh, that they, their, their lands not be expropriated and exploited, uh, so defending, uh, defending them. Uh, then he, you know, he, in 2015, goes to Cuba. There, basically, he's continuing the same policies as Pope John Paul II of reaching out to Cuba. Uh, the world should reach out to Cuba, and Cuba should reach out to the world, should be open to the world and the world should be open to Cuba. Uh, and then, of course, he comes uh, from Cuba uh, to the United States, where he visits the White House, the Congress, and the United Nations. I won't talk much about that, because you all followed that when he came here uh, to the United States. I would say, though, that the, the wonderful image that came out of that uh, visit to the United States was not the Pope talking in Congress, but where the Pope went after he talked in Congress. You know, he didn't have lunch with Paul Ryan uh, talking about his budget. Uh, rather, he went to a homeless shelter uh, where he had lunch with the people who lived uh, there. It was a place in, you know, from, you know, spending his time with the, the most powerful leaders you know, on Capitol Hill, he gets in the car and drives not too far away to be with people who are hungry and need, need the church's help to be fed. This was sending a message about who's important uh, in the United States and who we should be concerned about. That's a political message, uh, if I ever saw one. Uh, in Kenya and in Central African Republic, Again, the stress on interreligious dialogue, the environment, poverty, reconciliation, peace, and against corruption. His visit to Central African Republic was extraordinary. Um, this is a country where Christians and Muslims have been killing each other. And uh, he, he comes to, to uh, the Central African Republic and says, I want to go to the main mosque in the capital. Oh, you can't do that. It's not safe. You know, this Muslim 
section of the city was totally barricaded, had barricades all around it because they were in fear of their lives. They were in fear of, of Christian militias coming in and killing them. So you had these, these barricades all around that part of the city. Uh, he comes, they take down the barricades so the Pope can go in. The barricades did not go back up, at least not immediately. <laughs> You know, the, the role of reconciliation, of interreligious dialogue, that is so important in Africa uh, where there is these uh, terrible ethnic, religious, tribal conflicts over resources, over water, over uh, oil, over whatever, over political power. And what starts as a fight over resources or a tribal, ethnic uh, fight, you know, if one group is of one religion, another group is another religion, then it explodes into an interreligious war. Uh, this is happening in Nigeria and uh, in the Central African Republic. Terrible, terrible things in the Central African Republic. Um, and the Pope, he, it, no... No security advisor would have allowed the Pope to go to the Central African Republic. Crazy idea. Uh, then the Pope goes to Cuba again and meets with the Patriarch uh, Krill, the Russian uh, Moscow Patriarch. This again was a very controversial meeting. Now the truth of the matter is John Paul II and Benedict would have killed to get a meeting with the patriarch. They, they wanted a meeting so badly with the Moscow patriarch, but he never wanted to meet with them. Just would not do it. Uh, and uh, what brought them together was Syria and probably Putin. Putin saying, go meet the Pope. And the patriarch tends to do whatever Putin tells him to do. So, uh, the uh, uh, Syria and the concern about what's happening to the Christians in Syria and, and in the Middle East uh, bought, brought Patriarch Kill uh, and the Pope together in Cuba, which was considered neutral territory. They weren't going to meet in Rome. They weren't going to meet in Russia. So where are they going to meet? Cuba. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's where they meet. People, some people were very upset about this meeting. Uh, certainly the Ukrainian Orthodox uh, churches, some of the Ukrainian, uh, the independent ones, the Catholics in Ukraine, very upset about this because of uh, uh, the bad relations between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, so this was a very, very controversial visit. But for the Pope... This was important because of ecumenical relations. He's looking not, you know, this was the first meeting and he's looking forward to future meetings uh, because, you know, the reconciliation of, of Catholics and Orthodox has always been high on the agenda of the papacy. Uh, so this was a very important meeting, but one that he got a lot of criticism uh, from uh, for doing then uh, the Pope goes to Lesbos, and again, uh, showing his concern for, uh, uh, for refugees. These were refugees uh, uh, who had come from uh, Syria and other parts of the Middle East, and it got as far as Lesbos, Greece, uh, on that island. Uh, and he, the Pope came there to thank the Greeks for welcoming these refugees, but also calling on the rest of Europe to be welcoming and to help in, in uh, uh, responding to these refugees. He ended up, I think, uh, how many families? To 30 people or that he brought home with him to Rome from Lesbos. He just put them on the plane and said, okay, we're, we're going to take you uh, to the Vatican and we're going to find you housing and jobs and We'll, we're going to take care of you to, as a symbolic gesture to the rest of, of Europe and the world about what should be done. Uh, but again, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. 
showing him meeting uh, with uh, these people uh, with their signs uh, asking for help. You see the Eusebius and others there. Other papal trips, Armenia, Poland. I, I list all these trips just so you get a feel for... He's done a lot of traveling, as, in, as you know very well. <laughs> all your frequent flyer miles. You don't get them. Oh, that's terrible. Oh, bad news. <laughs> anyway, uh, these various places. Sweden, of course, was, uh, was one. Uh, he went there for the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Uh, because then they had a big uh, ceremony there. I mean, I mean, when I was in grammar school, if you told me that the Pope and a and, and bunch of Protestant leaders were going to get together to celebrate the Reformation, I would have laughed in, at you, if not excommunicated you. Uh, this, you know, but this is, this is what he, uh, he did there. Egypt was uh, uh, one of the places he, he visited last year. And there he met with the other pope, uh, the Coptic pope, uh, who is there dressed in black. I actually met him last month myself. And then on the other side of the Coptic pope is uh, Patriarch Bartholomew, but I, uh, in this particular shot, he, he wasn't there. But again, the, the, the three of them getting together, talking about uh, ecumenism, ecumenical dialogue, better relations between the churches, and their common concern for the plight of the Christians in the Middle East. Uh, terrible, terrible situation. I mean, it's t tough enough in Egypt, you know, but as compared to places like uh, Syria and uh, uh, Iraq and, and Iran and other places, uh, very uh, difficult for Christians. And uh, they're there uh, uniting uh, and supporting one another. The Pope just simply being there to support the Coptic Pope and the, and the Patriarch. And then all the th three of them speaking in common uh, for the plight of the refugees and the Christians in the Middle East. But probably even more important than this meeting was his meeting with the Grand Imam. I also met him uh, last month uh, when I was in Egypt. This is, the Grand Imam is the head of the Al-Azhar University in Cairo, which is the preeminent uh, Muslim uh, university in the world, where uh, thousands of, of students uh, are studying uh, various topics, but uh, many Imams being trained there who go all over the world. Uh, this is... Some people even refer to it as the Vatican of Islam, although the Va you know, Islam does not have a Vatican, doesn't have a pope. But uh, the things that are said, the statements by the Grand Imam and the scholars there at that university have wide impact throughout Islam. So when the pope goes there, meets with them, uh, speaks of Islam as a religion of peace, when they, they join together in condemning uh, extremism and, and violence in the name of religion, this is important. This has political impact. This is, this is what popes do as part of their diplomatic political mission uh, on these trips. Uh, so this was an extremely important meeting. And, but again, you know, he, the pope gets criticized for these things. For, for meeting with, uh, in situations like this. More papal trips to Portugal. Uh, you're going to be talking about that. Uh, Colombia. Colombia, again, was one of these visits that was sort of risky because he came there to support the peace process. Remember, there was the f fight between the government and the rebels that had gone on for decades. Uh, and they were finally having a peace process. A lot of people didn't like the peace process because you're giving amnesty to these murderers, these terrorists, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Pope comes to support the peace process. And, you know, at a time when the people of Colombia were very divided uh, on this. Uh, so very important uh, trip with a political message. Um, 
in, uh, in there's again uh, meeting with indigenous groups uh, in Colombia. Papal trips to Myanmar and Bangladesh, which Innes is going to speak on quite a bit. Uh, I'll just say a little bit about it. I wrote a column before he went uh, to uh, Myanmar, uh, also known as Burma, uh, and said, dumb idea, they should have talked him out of it. He should never have gone, never go, he should not go. Because he was caught. Um, because, and it was all about the use of the word Rohingya. Uh, he was, this was, is a word that is anathema to the, uh, the Buddhists in, uh, in Myanmar. It's anathema to the government. Uh, they just do not accept that word. But the Rohingya people, you know, who are Muslim as opposed to the Buddhist majority, that's the way they describe themselves and that's the way they want to be called. They want to be recognized for who they are as uh, permanent residents of Myanmar and not just illegal aliens uh, who should be chased out of the country. So this was a politically charged word, uh, Rohingya. Now, the cardinal in Myanmar told the Pope, don't use the word. Uh, every human rights group was telling the Pope, you got to use the word. Are you a prophet? Are you, you know, are you going to, are you going to kowtow to the government? So it was, he was in a no, you know, a no win situation. If he uses the word Rohingya, the Catholics in, uh, in Myanmar might get all beat up and, uh, by the Buddhist monks and stuff. Uh, if he doesn't use the word, he's going to be condemned as, you know, hey, oh, you're not, you know, you, we're, 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 don't you have any guts? Aren't you going to speak out? Or are you just like Pius XII, you know? Uh, he, he doesn't use the word Rohingya until he gets to Bangladesh and actually meets with some of the Rohingya uh, refugees. Then he uses the word, but he doesn't use it in the country. This is that diplomatic niceties of papal diplomacy. It's always interesting. When uh, John Paul II came to the United States and met with Clinton, all the pro-lifers wanted him to chew out Clinton, shake his finger at him and call him, you know, a baby killer. Didn't happen. That's not the way popes do diplomacy. You know, any more that, you know, a lot of my progressive friends wanted Pope Francis when he spoke to Congress to really read Paul Ryan and his budget, the Riot Act, how this is totally contrary to Catholic social teaching and is, is killing the poor. Didn't do that. That's not the way papal diplomacy is done. His response was he didn't use the word Rohingya because he wanted to communicate with the government. He said what he wanted to say, and he communicated what he wanted to communicate, but he, he, feels, he felt that if he used that word, the door would have just simply closed, and that would have been it. Now, it took me a while before you know, I said, well, was this a good idea, wasn't it, or was it a bad idea? I think, it, he, I think his prestige took a little bit of a hit. I think, you know, I think, with certainly with hu certain human rights groups and others. On the other hand, it, this trip helped the Rohingya like crazy. They never had had so much media coverage. And they haven't had since, exactly. Everybody was, you know, the, I mean, more journalists had to learn how to spell Rohingya uh, or pronounce it. Yeah, and, and all of this, I mean, he brought this topic in, in fact, the, you know, will he say it? Will he say it? Well, every, you know, every one of those stories had to explain what the issues were. So simply by going, he, you know, he raised the, the whole issue of the Rohingya to a level that it had not had. Yeah, the name of God today. Yeah, yeah, very, very strong. But he did it there, not in Burma, you know. <laughs> So, you know, and I, so I, I think, I think his prestige took a minor hit, but 
he did wonderful things for the Rohingya by go, by doing what he did. So, which so I you know that's what popes you're, popes are supposed to take a hit every once in a while for the good. So uh, anyway, then Chile and per, uh, Peru, uh, and I'll end with that picture uh, <laughs> because. Uh, to make the point that not everybody likes what this pope is doing. Uh, <laughs> some people are shocked. Some people are surprised. Some people are appalled. Uh, actually, I think that guy was just making fun. But, uh, and enjoying himself. But it, it, it kind of shows that he, he's, you know, what he's doing is not selling with everybody. Let me conclude by first, just making a few points. First, I think the major thing is his foreign policy, his diplomatic policy, is in continuity with the Vatican's that's been in place for decades. Talk to everybody, interreligious dialogue, Catholic social teaching. There's nothing new there. This has been the policy of the Vatican for decades. Uh, there is this conflict between being diplomatic and being prophetic. I think that's... That's in the nature of the job. Uh, and how do you work that out? How strong do you come on? You know, uh, diplomats are not prophets. Prophets are not diplomatic. And yet we want a pope who will be prophetic. But we also want a pope, well, we got a pope who has to be diplomatic. How you play those two things off, that's, that's an art. It's not a science. And that's why he gets the big bucks. Uh, because that's what he's, he's got to make that balance all the time. The th third thing I'd say is he, he's willing to take chances. I think going to the Central African Republic was taking a big risk. Going to Colombia uh, to support the peace process there was taking a big risk. Going to Myanmar was taking a big risk. He is willing to take risks when he thinks it's it's worthwhile. Uh, and finally, the use of symbolic gesture. He really knows how to do that, as you can see through from the pictures that we've had so far. Uh, he recognizes that he's, when he's on these trips, he's not just speaking to political leaders. He's not just speaking to the elites. He's speaking to the people in the streets. Because if you're going to have change, it's not just changing the opinions of leaders, you, it's cultural change. Change that happens at the lowest pass, you know, at the street level. Uh, this is extremely important. Uh, in my work as on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, it's clear when we visit some countries, like say Pakistan, you know, some of the, the political leaders would be much more open to religious freedom, but if they are, they could be lynched by a mob, they can be killed. I mean, and leaders are killed, sometimes by their bodyguards, you know, uh, in, in situations. So you've got to, it's not just the leaders you have to convince, it's the people in the streets. And that is, um, is who Pope Francis is trying to communicate with. Thank you very much. So we have time for just a few questions now, uh, if anybody has one. Interesting question. Uh, how does he choose his trips? Maybe you can answer that when you, when you talk. You probably know much more about this than I do. I mean, obviously, he's getting a geographical spread. You know, he's got uh, Latin America. Notice how he's avoiding Argentina. Uh, you know, he wanted to visit other countries in, our, in Latin America before he went to Argentina. Yeah, <laughs> yes, and uh, and you know, and then he he visited some countries in Africa and in Asia. So I think there's there's an attempt to go to different places. Um, sometimes it's simply where World Youth Day is being celebrated or World Family Day. That's why he came to the United States. Uh, things like that can can influence where, and those things are planned years in advance. Uh, can influence where he goes. And sometimes it's, you know, uh, the local bishops' conference really begs him to come or wants him to come or for one reason or another. So it's hard to give one single criteria. 
Uh, the appointment of, of cardinals, that I think, his change in the selection of cardinals is one of the most radical things that he has done. In the past, uh, cardinals were principally uh, selected from major metropolitan sees, Arnold, you know, things that were called like cardinalatial sees, places like Venice. I mean, Venice has had a cardinal archbishop for centuries. Doesn't now. I mean, the, the archbishop of, of Venice is even called a patriarch. Uh, not, not, not a cardinal now. He goes down into the middle of Italy and finds some place that hasn't had a cardinal in in uh, since the last well, since, since no two nineteenth century, you know, so and and picks there he 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 picks a bishop in Haiti who's not even an archbishop makes him a cardinal he picks an auxiliary bishop in El Salvador was it? El Salvador and an auxiliary bishop and makes him a cardinal I mean this this is insane this is totally contrary to all of the rules in other words he's picking the the man rather than the place. And this is this has allowed him to really transform the papacy. Because if he had kept to the traditional method, he would have been appointing as cardinals people who had been selected by John Paul and by Benedict. You know, because they were the ones who appointed him to Venice. They were the ones who appointed him to all these these cardinalatial sees. They just hadn't gotten around to making them a cardinal yet. And he's basically saying, forget it. You know, I'll find, you know, Archbishop of Indianapolis. I'm surprised he even knew where Indianapolis was. You know, and skips over Philadelphia. Uh, so this is, th this is a extraordinary change. And it's allowed him to have a tremendous impact on the, on the College of Cardinals. He's already appointed 40% of the Cardinals. I don't, I'm not sure there's even a John Paul II Cardinal left. In the cardinal in the College of Cardinals, if there is, there's only one. I th I don't think there's even one now. They're, they're all Benedict ones, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I only count those under 80. Once they turn 80, I ignore them. So, uh, yeah. So it's now. What does that have anything to do with his diplomatic agenda? Interest. You know. Uh, some of the cardinals, uh, like there were some. Uh, I forget their names. Who were Appointed from um, islands, uh, yeah, that you know maybe underwater if global warming uh, continues. You know, I mean, this is this you know this is giving a voice to some of the people who will be impacted by climate change is probably one thing that's involved here. But his his, his he's really looking for people who are with the poor, concerned about the poor. He had a practice when he was. Uh, novice director, he would send the novices into the slums to uh, work. And when they came back, he'd look at their shoes. If their shoes were muddy, he knew they had a good experience. If they were still shiny, he knew they needed to go back. Uh, they had not been really with the people. And so I think he's looking for bishops with muddy shoes, you know, not shiny shoes. People who are going down into the slums, meeting with people, uh, you know, dealing pastorally with people, defending the poor, people who, have, who basically have adopted his agenda. Yes, John Paul II uh, clearly had a had a real style. I mean, he was, um, I mean, he was an actor as a young man. He, he he performed on the stage, so he was very comfortable getting out there on a stage and interacting with an audience, with, with people. Uh, and so uh, he was very comfortable in doing that. And, and I, I agree with you. He knew the value of these kinds of symbolic gestures. And you, you could find a hundred pictures like of him with indigenous people with feathered, and him in a feathered cap and sombreros and all of those, those kinds of photo opportunities that he would do. A major difference would be uh, John Paul II, he spoke an academic language, very abstract language. This pope really speaks in simple language. 
I remember reading uh, one of John Paul's encyclicals, and I kept falling asleep reading this one paragraph. I had the heart, I, finally, I had to read it out loud to get through it. And then I went back and I counted the commas, the semicolons, and the dashes. There were like 30 commas, four dashes, and six semicolons. And it was only, the paragraph was one sentence. This is not intelligible language. This is not the language of simplicity. This is not the language of people who, who uh, uh, aren't academically trained. Uh, I'm not even sure it's the language of that. But in any case, yeah, I mean, so that, I would say that is the big difference. I think that John Paul, of course, he had, he, you know, he, know, he knew Eastern Europe like Francis knows Latin America. John Paul did not understand Latin America, uh, but he, he was the right man at the right time, at the right place uh, to deal with the fall of communism and help it to happen in Eastern Europe. Extraordinary, uh, the impact he had on, on history of making that happen, helping to make that happen. Um, but, uh, uh, and you know, and Francis doesn't understand Eastern Europe. Uh, you know, uh, you know, but, uh, so I think, you know, each had, each has their own gifts, their own, uh, uh, and, and I don't know, I think sometimes God just provides the right person at the right time. I mean, John Paul was the right person at the right time to be there, uh, to help, uh, bring down the, uh, Soviet empire, uh, just absolutely historically extraordinary uh, event. Uh, Francis now is going to be the right man at the right time. This is, I think, uh, it makes me truly believe in the power of the Holy Spirit uh, <laughs> to make this happen through this incredibly unique institution called the College of Cardinals. The, the, I mean, the big issue right now between the Vatican and China, of course, is the appointment of bishops. And they've been negotiating that for, well, for decades, uh, and every six months uh, for the last 20 years, I've seen a story in the newspapers saying, they are about to make an agreement, and then it, nothing happens. And now we're hearing the same uh, story. I think, it's ac I, I, I think it's actually may happen, finally. Uh, at least the Vatican thinks it's not going to be soon, uh, but it may, it may uh, actually happen. The question, and the, 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 Vatican, the Pope and the Vatican are getting under a lot of criticism here. Uh, you know, they're, they're asking some uh, uh, bishops who were uh, loyal to Rome to resign, uh, and then their positions would be taken by some uh, bishops who were, uh, uh, you know, came up through the patriotic, patriotic church. Now, on the other hand, you got to remember that John Paul II and Benedict also recognized, what is it, 30 bishops that came up through the Patriotic Church? You know, a lot of these, these bishops who, who came up through the Patriotic Church, you know, when they were outside of Rome, would meet with a nuncio and secretly pledge their, their fidelity to the Pope, but they could never do that back in China. So it, I think the Vatican wants to heal the divisions between the the the, uh, the the Christ the Chinese Christians who were kind of loyal and suffered because of their loyalty to the Pope, and those who, you know, are have been making do with you know in within the Patriotic Church. Now, I the, the Pope has been criticized heavily by conservatives for for this. I, I, I mean, my feeling about it is, I mean, the Vatican is negotiating with somebody that has a gun to their head. I mean, don't, <laughs> or, or, you know, or, or another analogy is you're trying to negotiate a hostage situation and you don't have any police behind you. It's just you trying to get these hostages free from people who have guns. I mean, it's not like the Vatican is in a power position. You know, uh, 
it could, it could issue a big condemnation of the Chinese, which would run in the newspapers for maybe 24 hours, and then, then you have to live with the Chinese for the next 10 years. So I, it, I, they're in a very difficult situation. Um, the, the, what the Vatican, I think, had hoped for was getting the same solution that they got in Vietnam which is basically the Vatican presents a turna, three names, present, you know, shows them to the Vietnamese government, and Vietnamese government might, you know, they kind of have a veto or do they not? You know, it's all kind of kept vague, but clearly if the Vietnamese government really raised hell, the Vatican would probably pull the name and not appoint someone who would alienate them. Um, what the... Ch Chinese, it sounds like what they're pushing for is they're going to present the three names to the Holy See. Now, how is that all going to actually be done? I mean, the Chinese government wants to decide who the next Dalai Lama is. The atheistic Chinese communist government is going to decide how the Dalai Lama is reincarnated uh, in, you know, after he dies. I mean, this is the kind of government you're dealing with. You know, they kidnapped the, the other Lama, I, I forget, the Pacham, the Pacham Lama. You know, when he was nine years old, we haven't seen him for, what, 20 years? This poor kid, you know, uh, who was the reincarnation of, uh, you know, and, and, but this is the kind of government you are dealing with. And how do you, you know, how do you do that? And uh, the Vatican, I think, has to make the best possible deal it can. Uh, you know, this is one of those cases where you can be prophetic. And if, you know, it's one thing to be prophetic and suffer for it. It's another thing to be prophetic and somebody else suffers for it. And I, so I'm kind of sympathetic with the Vatican's approach to this, of trying to make the best of a bad situation and, and try and make it better. Now, if, if the Chi actually, if the Chinese, if the solution ended up being, okay, the priests in the diocese would get together and elect the bishop and then present it to Rome. That, that might be a good solution. In fact, that's the way bishops were selected in the ancient church. It's only in the, la in the 19th and 20th century that bishops have been appointed by Rome. The problem with that system, of course, is the Chinese police come in and tell them who they are to elect and, you know, and can pressure them that way. But, you know, this may be a you know, way. And, of course, in all of these situations, you're trying to guess will things, how will things evolve. In Vietnam, for example, the situation of the church today is much better than it was in the, in the period immediately after uh, the United States left and the, the, we lost the war. Uh, things are much better. Uh, when I, I remember being in the foreign ministry office, again as part of the commission, and raising the question of, you know, uh, Catholics in, in Vietnam, and the, I think he was uh, the high official in the foreign ministry said, well, now you're Catholic, aren't you? And he pointed to one of the young women in his office, and she said, yes, yes, I'm Catholic. And then he said, yes, and my son goes to Loyola Chicago. I mean, they're about as communist as, as people working on Wall Street. I mean, all they're concerned about is money and power. Uh, so things evolve and change. And, and in China, what, if, what are things going to be in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? This is, this is the timeline the, the Vatican has to think about also. Is, is, can things get incrementally better? The status quo is unacceptable to have the two churches, the two communities split and, and, and having this t adversarial relationship between the government and, and the Catholic Church. So how do you heal that and hopefully move it forward? Does that mean, okay, you're going to have bishops that are cheerleaders for the party leadership? Yeah. If that's what it takes to survive... And, you know, and to uh, have the sacraments and have all the pastoral things. You know, you're going to have a church that is, that does everything except the prophetic role. 
It will not talk about human rights. It will not talk about democracy. It will not talk about corruption. But it will, it will preach that part of the, it will preach about God's love for people, of mercy, compassion, forgiveness, uh, the need to love one another and love one's neighbor, the, you know, all those things that, but will it, but it will not be able to, to be a prophetic voice in China. And, uh, no, you know, because nobody can be a prophetic voice in China. You're thrown in jail. So I, I'm I'm sympathetic with with the with the Vatican approach right now, and hope and pray something they can get something that works. Um, I talked too long. So. No, you've you done very well. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Father Tom Reese. Thank you.